Okay, hello everyone and welcome to our session about requirements and reuse. Uh, we are going to follow the same pattern through, uh, that is going on throughout the conference. And we have a set of presentations. Every presentation will be five minutes and will be presented upfront in a block. And after that, we'll have time to have some discussions and questions. If you are from the audience or the presenters and would like to post questions on the chat, please prefix the question with the name of the author that you do want to ask questions. And without further ado, I would like to introduce our first presenter, that is Alvaro Vezaga. Alvaro is going to talk about on systematically building a controlled natural language for functional requirements. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, I am Alvaro from the University of Luxembourg, and I will present our first journal paper entitled On Systematically Building a Controlled Natural Language for Functional Requirements. Requirements are crucial in all software and system development projects because they state the necessary characteristics of quality, qualities of a system. Most software requirements specifications are written in natural language. Studies confirmed that 71.8% of software requirements are written in natural language. This is because natural language can be used in all application domains and understood virtually by all project stakeholders. The quality of a software system greatly depends on the quality requirements. High quality requirements improve the system quality, the return of investments, and the customer satisfaction. On the other side, having missing, vague, incomplete may cause projects to fail, excessive maintenance, or disappointed business users. The problem we address in this paper was motivated by practical need observed across many industrial domains. For example, our industrial partner reported us that several communication problems and delays arise from requirements that are not stated precisely enough. In this paper, we develop a controlled natural language for writing functional requirements. Remain aims at helping analysts to improve the quality of requirements. In these slides, we see the, our systematic, uh, systematic methodology to define our controlled natural language consisting of five steps. First step, we extract requirement. Second, we identify codes and their corresponding verbs. A code identifies a group of verbs that share the same information content in natural language requirements. Third, we manually label the requirements extracted in step one with the codes identified in step two. Fourth, once we have labeled all the data set, we group requirements that share the same code to better identify common information content among requirements. Once we identify the information content of requirements, in the last step, we derive the grammar rules to build our language. For our empirical evaluation, one of the research questions was about determining how well our controlled natural language can capture requirements of previous unseen documents. To answer this research question, we conducted an industrial case study with our partner, ClearStream Luxembourg. In this study, we follow an iterative process consisting of four steps where the goal was to rephrase requirements that have not seen before using our control natural language remain. We calculate the number of requirements that were rephrased using remain. In the table, we can see that in average, 88% of the natural language requirements statements in four previously unseen software requirements specification from the financial domain. We also kept track uh, of the requirements that we were not able to rephrase using our control natural language. 
by annotating each requirement with one of the following three causes. Cause one, the requirement contains a verb that is not supported by remind. Cause two, some information content excluding the verb is not supported by remind. Cause three, the meaning of the requirement is unclear and no financial analyst could clarify it. As conclusions, uh, we uh, point out the following aspects. The quality of a software system greatly depends on the quality of its requirements. Control natural languages compared to conventional requirements patterns provide structures with more specialized concepts and constructs. Control natural languages strike a balance between the usability of the natural language and the rigorous of formal languages. Control natural language enable our analysis such as test case generation and model generation. Our evaluation shows that Remace is expressive enough to capture most of the unseen requirements from the financial domain. Thank you very much for your, for your, for your attention. Thank you, Alvaro, for the nice presentation. And I'd like now to call the second presenter. That will be Joseph Kekuru. I'm going to talk about Prazi from package based to call based dependency networks. Yes, so hello everyone. So my name is uh, Joseph Heidrup. Um, I'm going to talk about Prazi from package based to call based dependency networks. Uh, this is work uh, together with uh, Morris Beller, Konstantinos Triamfonu, and Gorgos Gusius. And this is our MC Journal First paper for this year. So probably many of you do have like a favorite uh, CLI that you install your packages. Could be NPM, could be Cargo for Rust, et cetera. And most of us use it to be able to download packages that we can import in our software projects. And what is like very interesting briefly is that these repositories are quite large. So for example, you can see that for a very recent ecosystem like uh, uh, Crazed.io for Rust, it's about average 66 new packages per day. In the case of NPM, it almost has like 2 million packages. It's about like 10,052 new packages. Packages are quite large and contain lots of third party libraries. Uh, and in this uh, study, so like uh, in many previous uh, studies on uh, dependency networks of package repositories, they usually use a metadata based representation. That is, if you see in the figure, for example, like the connection from app uh, to lib1 and then to lib2. Um, but what we were doing is that we were uh, instead looking at a more fine grained representation by looking into the function calls uh, between packages as a way to understand how packages are reusing each other. Uh, and for example, and I, I, I use cases, you know, like vulnerabilities, which is quite a common one. So for example, if we do have a vulnerability in the function intern, we can directly see that there is a reachable path. But for example, if there is a vulnerable function, a vulnerable a vulnerability in function unused, then we can directly see that there's no connecting path. But when it comes to metadata based analysis, we would not find it because we would always say that because something is vulnerable in lib2, then app is directly vulnerable because of it. And we were kind of curious, okay, so uh, what if we, let's say, like uh, use, let's say, like a call based dependency network and compare that with a metadata based network and see how things differ? So, one sort of simple uh, let's say like a uh, application is for example what is like the number of direct dependencies right so usually we would just uh, like count the number of the clear dependencies to it and when we looked at it compared to uh, looking at the number of calls to dependency we, we found that the like when you look at direct dependencies let's say like the approximation is similar so if you have if you declare on, on a dependency most likely you are calling it but then when we look at the number of transitive dependencies, the story is a bit different. So for example, like we looked at like uh, the network, I mean, at crazy.io, let's say like in February, we found that for example, when you use like the declared metadata, it will say that on average, you will use, let's say like uh, 17 uh, transitive dependencies. But then when you look at the call base one, you see there's roughly 60, six uh, uh, dependencies. So we found that most packages are not directly calling 60% of its resolved transitive dependencies. So uh, sort of coming to the conclusions, so like when should you use, let's say like a metadata based network? Well, when it comes to direct dependencies, but also let's say like if you want to 
uh, build the Celica Cobra for every single package of a repository. It's quite some effort and not very easy to do in general, especially for, uh, I mean, in the case of Creator and Rust, it has a very nice build system, so it's not so difficult to do it. But then also, as we know, for example, that a lot of package repositories, they're not a homogeneous collection of software. There are some packages that might use, let's say, like more code generation, use more like dynamic features like reflection, for example. And then you might not have so sound packages, uh, so, so sound representations, right? Um, so when should you use, let's say, like a call-based uh, network? And the reason is that you should always try to do it when you have, let's say, like when you want to analyze transitive dependencies. So the reason why is that if you look back to the other figure, uh, one main problem is that uh, uh, like when you look at the functions that you call direct dependency, right? You call a certain, a certain number of APIs. And those APIs, let's say, like uh, might not reach to all of the transitive dependencies. Sometimes when you call one part of the code, it doesn't mean that you directly call the other part of the, the transitive dependencies. Uh, and then another thing is that you have, let's say, like much better actionability because instead of looking at the clear data, we actually look into the source code and can reason more about it. And uh, another sort of important thing, which I was trying to illustrate with the figure, is that you have much better precision because you can directly see what is actually, let's say, like being called and uh, used in general. And uh, yeah, this was like very, very brief overview. So if you want to know more about the work and etc., feel free to check out like the MC Journal uh, paper. Uh, thanks a lot. That's uh, uh, yeah, all from me. Thank you very much again, John. Uh, I should remain people that the first paper and the second paper are John and Force papers, and the next paper that we have in these sessions are technical papers from the conference. Uh, our next speaker is Saad Ezimi, and Saad is going to talk about handling of anaphoric ambiguity in requirements, a multi-solution study. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Azina. I represent our paper automated handling of anaphoric ambiguity in requirements, a multi-solution study. Um, first, I will start by reading this uh, requirement specification excerpt from a developer point of view. The SNT component shall send all approval requests to the DBS. If the request contains storage parameters, it shall create a configuration record from the parameters. So in this small paragraph, to know what to implement, the developer must know which subsystem should create the configuration record in this case. Uh, first, I will define uh, uh, antecedents. Antecedents are the preceding entities that the pronoun refers to. In our case, the plausible antecedents for the pronoun it are the SNT component, all approval requests, the DBS, the request, and the storage parameters. <clears throat> so uh, if we eliminate the obviously wrong ones, we still have uh, two candidate antecedents that are left with two different um, implementations. Uh, we know that without domain knowledge, the developer is unlikely to correctly uh, disambiguate the pronoun it. And uh, in general, this is uh, anaphoric ambiguity. <laughs> so as we have seen, uh, anaphora is uh, prevalent in requirements. Uh, it occurs in around 25% uh, in our data set. Uh, it needs domain knowledge, which is not adequately captured by all involved stakeholders. So we developed and experimented with uh, six solutions based on language models, machine learning, and uh, off-the-shelf NLP tools. We, uh, we empirically evaluated these the solutions on uh, two data sets. Uh, this is an example of uh, anaphora problem formulation. Uh, the problem is composed from two components, the pronoun, um, context, and candidate antecedents. The pronoun is the problematic uh, pronoun. In our case, it's pronoun it. The context are the uh, requirement that contains the pronoun and the, the preceding one. Uh, Condensed antecedents are the preceding noun phrases that come before the pronoun it. In our case, we have uh, five that we highlight in this case. So uh, in our work, we handle ambiguity via two tasks. The first one is uh, anaphora ambiguity detection. Its goal is to detect whether the um, pronoun is ambiguous or not. The second one is anaphora resolution. 
its goal is to uh, find the uh, correct antecedents for uh, a given pronoun. So uh, our six solutions that we uh, what that we propose, the first two are based on uh, span birds, which is a variant of uh, birds language model that is optimized for span selection. Uh, so the first uh, solution, SpanBert NLP, is fine-tuned on a large NLP dataset. Uh, SpanBert RE is the SpanBert NLP that is fine-tuned again on a smaller uh, RE dataset. The inputs of both models are context and pronoun pairs. The outputs are uh, text spans with their uh, prediction probabilities. For the three other um, solutions uh, we have, they are based on machine learning. Uh, the first one uses language features that we uh, gathered and enhanced from uh, literature. Uh, the second one uses uh, feature embeddings uh, that we extract from sentence birds. Uh, machine learning ensemble uh, combines both machine learning solutions in an ensemble fashion. The input of the three models are context, context pronoun, and quantitative antecedent triplets. Uh, the outputs are the quantitative antecedents labeled with correct, incorrect, or inconclusive. Uh, the last solution is based on uh, uh, NLP uh, coreference tools. Uh, we combine two NLP uh, coreference tools that provide resolution for uh, pronouns in a given context. Uh, we combine the outputs in uh, an assembly fashion. If uh, both um, tools agree in the resolution, then the pronoun is uh, deemed uh, is unambiguous and the resolution is the the resolution that they provide uh, if they disagree then the pronoun is uh, ambiguous uh, so for evaluating our uh, solutions uh, we use two data sets the first one damir which is our contribution that we built from 22 uh, software requirements documents and eight domains it contains more more than uh, 700 pronouns the second data set, RecEval, is a public RE data set. Uh, it has around 100 pronouns. In the first research question, we, uh, we try to uh, evaluate the, uh, uh, or to find which solution alternative is the most accurate for anaphora ambiguity detection. So as we see in this table, machine learning uh, based uh, solutions are the uh, notably machine learning ensemble technique over, uh, uh, overperform the other solutions. For the second research question, we evaluate the uh, Anaphora resolution task uh, using two types of accuracy, full match and uh, partial match. Uh, in our case, uh, SpanBurst based solutions are uh, the most performing here, and the SpanBurst RE uh, is uh, outperform uh, SpanBurst NLP by uh, a little margin. So in conclusion, we have seen the importance of anaphoric ambiguity requirements and how problematic it can be if left and dealt with. Our findings reveal that language models do not always outperform traditional supervised machine learning methods in this task. And uh, as we have seen, uh, combining language models with machine learning in one solution is uh, promising. Uh, thank you. And that's all. Thank you very much, Said. And I would like to call our next presenter, GD, that's going to talk about deep STL from English requirements to signal temporal logic. Okay. Ah, oh, hello everybody. I'm Jerry from TU Vienna. It's my pleasure to present our accepted paper that promotes the application of formal methods in industry. Our work invites that to translating English requirements into signal temporal logic to enable the compatibility between documented requirements and the input of existing runtime monitors. To this end, building a data set and training an AI model constitute the main scope of our work. We started with an empirical study for both STL and English requirements in the literature. To adjust the scarcity of training data, we then developed a workflow to generate a parallel corpus, as shown in the two columns below. Then we employed a transformer-based um, AI model to train the translator and then compared its performance with other models like um, SIG2SIG and attention 
We also developed a specialized tokenization method so that votes in the corpus can be efficiently encoded. These slides show test metrics of the translator. We firstly tested the train models on synthetic data. We found that the tension model and the transformer, their accuracies are pretty high with a trans transformer um, performing a little bit better. However, when we did extrapolation tests on real examples, so the translation accuracies of all models dropped considerably. Despite the loss of performance, we say transformer still does the best job. Uh, this slide shows the testing results of the transformer. As we can see, when the input language is very similar to the sentences in our data set, the translation quality is very high, and the translator can also handle synonymous inputs. However, when the style of the input language is different from what has been trained, as can be seen in our extrapolation test, all models would probably make mistakes. In the first example, we can see transformer translates correctly. However, the tension model fails to copy the identifier and the number, and they even mistranslate the greater narrow relation into smaller. The six to six four model fails to translate anything. In example two, transformer tends to add additional keyword called rice, while a tension model would, however, reverse the meaning again. Still, six to six performs very badly. For example three, transformer does the good job, but the, the attention model still makes the same mistakes. Mm. We think there are two possible future directions. The first is related to AI. We can see deep learning performs well when the testing data is similar to what have been trained. However, once the testing data is different from the training data, its extrapolation performance is very poor. This, perform and this problem is not so obvious for general commercial tasks where there is a huge amount of training data. However, for industrial applications with limited data, how to build a more interpretable and accurate learning mechanism is an interesting direction. The second question relates to my own research experience in this paper. The risk situation is always more complex than what is conveyed literally. Taking me as an example, I suffered from gout, which may cause acute pain in the foot ankle. And nearly every medical guidance will require a man patient to limit his uric acid down below six. If we know these requirements, can we be a doctor ourselves? Probably not, because we need a doctor to make the proper diagnosis according to comprehensive factors. So come back to the practice of engineering, which is also complex and needs professional knowledge. But in, in reality, what we obtained first is only industrial data sheet with fragments requirements. And sometimes without professional knowledge, we cannot even distinguish between what is a requirement and what is only a description. So I think IE may need to play a more proactive role in the whole life cycle of the way model. For example, we should distinguish what are the real important requirements in different phases. And uh, are there any causal links? How to evaluate positive and negative results? How much tolerance can we accept? Obviously, we need the main knowledge to know these details behind the context as we need the doctor to treat the disease rather than, rather than merely relying on the guidance. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Ji. And I'd like to call our next speaker, that is Yu Wendong. He's going to talk about SNR, constraint based type inference for incomplete Java code snippets. All right, can everyone see? Uh, excellent. Hi, everyone. I'm Yu Wen. Uh, this is my presentation about SNR a constraint-based type inference technique for incomplete Java code snippets. Uh, code snippets, snippets can be found in a variety of places, forums, Java docs, QA sites, uh, like in the screenshot from Stack Overflow. Uh, developers incorporate code snippets as part of their questions to help clarify what they're asking for and get more specific help. And oftentimes, people will also respond with code snippets to help illustrate their answers. But the problem with these code snippets is that they're generally incomplete. Uh, first, code snippets are generally syntactically incomplete. For this code snippet, we wrapped it with a class and method declaration to make it parsable. But this code snippet is still missing type information. Uh, we highlighted some of the missing types, like date format, date calendar, 
uh, these short names allow the code to be written more concisely. Uh, and the fully qualified names uh, for these types are generally specified in import statements, uh, which are not here, nor is there any library information here to help guide us. Here's the code snippet after the import statements are added, and this code snippet is finally adapted for real-world use. Uh, in general, uh, these challenges make it hard uh, to reuse code snippets from the internet. In this work, we focused uh, using type inference to infer the fully qualified names of the types found in the code snippet and use that to add the import statements to make the code compilable. Our unique insight for this work is to leverage uh, partial semantics of the code rather than resorting to machine learning-based approaches for type inference. Let's look at an example. Here we have a line from the code snippet before. From this line of code, we know a number of things. Uh, we know that calendar is a type with a simple name calendar, that this calendar type has a method get instance that takes uh, zero arguments and returns a type with a method get time uh, that takes zero arguments. And the return type of get time is a subtype uh, uh, for the type of the variable today. And today has the type uh, with a simple name date. We can leverage its knowledge to help us infer the types in the code. We annotate the AST with the type variables to show all the types using the code snippet. Using the type variables, we can translate the earlier knowledge to these five constraints, like tau2 has simple name calendar, uh, method get instance with uh, no arguments, return type of tau3. Uh, get time method is similar, uh, subtype constraint where uh, tau4 is a subtype of tau1. And we just need to solve for the type variables. To help solve for the type variables, we leverage a knowledge base, which we built from popular Java libraries, such as the JDK, Java Time, and more. In this sample, we can see there's a calendar class uh, with methods get instance and get time, which returns calendar and date. And there's a couple classes with a simple name date. These facts can help us solve the constraints from earlier. Uh, the knowledge base, in addition to storing uh, methods and fields, also contain relation information shown in this simplified schema. So with the constraints and the facts from the knowledge base, they can be fed to a data lock system, which give us a mapping from the types in DST to the fully qualified names of the type, which satisfy these constraints. Using constraint-based type inference, we can safely rule out uh, java.sql.date as the type for the variable today, as it will violate the subtype constraint since get time returns a util.date. To evaluate the performance of SNR, we gave 267 code snippets without import statements uh, to get a, a mapping between the API elements and the top one recommendation for their fully qualified names. Using that, we calculated the precision and recall of our tool. And we found that compared to existing, say, the art tool Coaster, uh, published in ASC 19, which uses machine learning based technique, uh, that SNR outperforms Coaster with very high. 98.2% precision and 79.66% recall. Uh, in summary, we introduced constraint-based type inference, a technique to automatically conduct type inference uh, with our unique insight of using partial semantic information on code snippets. We evaluated our technique and found SNR outperforms existing state of the art with high precision and recall. Thank you all for listening and uh, please check out the paper for more information. Thank you. Thank you very much again for a very interesting uh, presentation. First of all, I'd like to thank all the presenters for inspiring and very interesting work. And after that, I would like also to open the chat for questions. I took the liberty of a couple of questions, but please, I'll ask the presenters and the audience to start asking questions. While you prepare your question, maybe I'll, I'll start by asking a question to Alvaro. Uh, why are the functional requirements? Okay. 
our industrial partner, we work in collaboration with an industrial partner and we ask them to provide software requirements specification that they contain requirements. We analyze the requirements and the majority of them were uh, functional requirements. And we confirm that uh, with our industrial partner uh, that they mostly use functional requirements for describing uh, the, the requirements. That was the, the main reason that uh, we didn't consider uh, non-functional requirements because we didn't have enough uh, data points uh, where we can extract uh, data um, structures to build our, our language. Okay, but do you believe your work can be expanded for non-functional requirements? Uh, yes, uh, uh, in, in our in our paper, we uh, we describe in detail our methodology to extend or to create uh, control natural languages, and uh, yes, uh, we we believe that. Uh, it could be a good starting point uh, for creating control natural languages, not only functional uh, requirements, but also non-functional requirements. Okay, thank you. I see Mark has a question and it just came on screen. So you can unmute and ask the question directly. Can please. you hear me? Can you hear me? Excellent. Uh, thank you so much all for the great presentations. Uh, I have a question for G. Um, we have been trying to actually apply uh, this transformation from natural language requirements to some form of uh, temporal uh, logic. And uh, very similar to what uh, you were doing, I was very um, uh, pleased to see the good accuracy overall. Uh, what uh, I was a little bit puzzled by was, uh, you know, the the rather simple structure of the sentences and what we've often observed uh, in uh, real applications is that, you know, there might be variable names that are missing, uh, you know, you don't really have uh, these templated requirements that start uh, very cleanly to suggest that you have a conditional, for example, included at the beginning. So there are a lot of um, variations in how yes. these requirements, uh, in the form that the requirements may come in. So I'm wondering what your experience is and uh, you know, how does the approach cope when uh, you drift away from the, you know, the template looking uh, requirements that you have? Okay, thank you very much for your, uh, for your, for your, for your question. So uh, basically our research, our paper only considers the clear uh, uh, requirements. So it's a very strict uh, meaning of what the temporological means. And uh, what we mainly focuses on is uh, on the synonymous expressions. So uh, we have found that in the our literature review, maybe 30% of um, um, requirements are like this clear ones, and there are seventy percent is like what you have said, very indirect and ambiguous, and uh, even <laughs> expert needs a lot of time to translate. Them. <laughs> so, so I think maybe if we use deep learning next time, maybe I guess we can use the although what have generated is um, is a little bit uh, uh, strict, and not so flex, flexible. Maybe we can use some and. Uh, automatic data augmentation method in NLP to to enrich the <laughs> expressiveness of the English language. And but if if we say we want to translate very indirect or something ambiguous language, maybe I think the pure end-to-end -end translation I think maybe because it's a very hard to pre-process such kind of data sets. So maybe. Uh, Based on traditional NLP method like uh, rule based or knowledge injected method in, in, in this, maybe handle the translation procedure. But uh, I think it's still very hard, hard job to do. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I think, um, you know, my, my issue was that, uh, yeah, in reality, usually, you know, that 70% versus 30% uh, that you mentioned. This is the ratio one would expect, at least with the existing techniques, you know, whether it works or it doesn't. So um, that, that answers my question. Very, uh, 
very helpful. Yeah, Thank yes, you. Yes, as I want to uh, add more is that some because I'm focusing on electronics and uh, industrial applications, so some requirements need very deep understanding of the the business of electronics design or robotics design. So if we do not need this um, background, it's, it's also very hard for us to understand what they are saying. So this is my personal experience. So I put it, it into the second uh, direction. Yeah. Excellent. I have one comment, but I'll, I'll let others uh, ask questions. And if there is time, then I'll, I'll come back to, uh, to okay. your presenter. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I have a question to say. What is the average that you found in terms of percentage of anaphora in requirements? Did you do any analysis of that? Yeah. Um, for uh, In our data set, we analyzed around uh, 500, uh, pardon, 5,000 requirements. Uh, and we found around 25% um, of them contains anaphora. Okay. And, and the types of anaphora is not only the eat pronoun. No, uh, it was uh, only for uh, showing the example. We handle okay. all uh, types of pronoun. So we handle a pronominal anaphora to be uh, precise. Uh, not only third person pronouns, but all pronouns. Okay, thank you. And I think we have now a new question from Diksha Aria. And it's for you. I don't know if Diksha, if you'd like to turn on your video and your microphone, you can ask directly. I don't think so. Too. Okay, no problem. So we are going to read your question. Interesting work. Can the type inference handle overload the keywords and libraries based on context? Example, assert can be sourced from the assertions library or the JUnit library. Hmm. Yeah, interesting question. So if uh, our, we use a constraint-based uh, inference, so if there is some, uh, say, method that's in the assert library that's not in the JUnit library that was used in the code snippet, then, of course, we'll, uh, we'll say, okay, this, this method's not there, so we, it can't it must be from this library that yeah then they'll be able to uh infer um if say they have the exact same methods and you know they can be dropped in place uh with one another uh then it'll be a little more difficult but our technique uh, ensures that only one uh, such library will be uh brought in instead of say both and create conflicts in the class path uh, i hope that helps answer the question Thank you. Uh, Marta, you, I think you had a, wanted to, do, to make a comment. Maybe you can do it now. Pipe it in, but uh, yes, uh, actually there are two. Uh, so uh, there is work on requirements demarcation that uh, G might find helpful. Basically, he mentioned this problem of uh, differentiating between what is a requirement, what is a description, what is an example. So there is some work in the RE community uh, trying to do that uh, using AI. And um, then uh, another interesting bit um, is uh, the work that... Uh, um, has been done recently on extracting invariants from uh, Javadoc, for example, uh, where you have a very large volume of very nicely written uh, set of documents. So uh, these two are uh, quite relevant uh, to what uh, you've been doing, different types of uh, logic, obviously, but uh, uh, that might also be a very nice thing to look into. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I'm that really was... hoping that uh, this uh, thread of work that you've started uh, will uh, pick up. Uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, value there, and uh, you know, I'm obviously interested in, in where this is going. So, uh, looking forward to the next steps. Okay, thank you very much. Take care. Thank you. Any more questions?
No comments? Uh, there's one in chat. There's one. Oh, yes. G is uh, A G can ask directly, no? G? Okay. Oh, okay. So at the right, ask right. So, uh, Avaru, uh, I'm curious about the, how flexible the input language can the NCNL approach uh, ha handle, so sorry, a typo. So, one reviewer also mentioned this to us, so why they asked us why we not consider this CNL approach. So, because I'm a new in the requirements and engineering, so I would like to ask, is CNL a common approach in practice? Uh, <clears throat> thank you for the question. Uh, well, uh, mm, there are different approaches that tackle uh, that are, have been used to improve uh, the the quality of the requirements. We decided to use control natural languages because, uh, uh, apart from restricting the syntaxes, they also restrict. Uh, we we can also define precisely the semantics. And this allow us to uh, find uh, more uh, easy the content information towards the test, uh, towards the task automation. Uh, we also have a, a, a work uh, which where uh, we use uh, this language, our language, in order to uh, generate acceptance criteria from uh, uh, from uh, textual requirements. Yeah, thank you very much. So another question is that uh, I actually shot the just today. So you spend a lot of time, months, to collect the, this data. So how how is it uh, doable for for you? So so is there a company collab collaborated with you, or you just uh, want to search these requirements in the literature? So uh, so yeah. <laughs> so so I'm curious about the source of the data. You yeah, yes. Uh, regarding the source of the data, uh, was I, I couldn't uh, listen completely your question because uh, uh, I don't know whether I have uh, communication issues here. But uh, your question is re regarding the source of uh, of our da data set. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, so I'm curious about the procedure, how to collect uh, this this data because it's very time consuming and. Uh, <laughs> Yes, uh, uh, well, uh, we, uh, we work with a company and this company provided us uh, Word documents and PDF documents that they contain in, uh, in, in they, that they contain requirements. So we analyze the structure. Uh, fortunately for us, they delimit uh, with a certain type of structure where they define the, the requirements. So we take advantage to uh, uh, collect automatically from these specific parts from the document the requirements. So this process for us was automatically because uh, in this in, in our industrial par uh, partner uses a, a template and this template separates easily uh, the requirements from the other text. Okay, okay, I understand your approach. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, Thank you for the question. I believe you're not supposed to say the name of the industrial partner, at least the domain. Are you able to say the domain, the, the data that you receive from the industrial partner? It's a, it belongs to the financial domain. So we work financial with a company. Yeah, you here mentioned before. Okay. okay. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I think Saad has a question. Yes. I have a question for G. Okay. Uh, uh, if I understood correctly your work, uh, so you generate um, from uh, formulas? Oh, yes. Well, you start by generating randomly some formulas, right? Then yes. you tra transform these formulas into uh, text, into requirements. Yes, yes. Using, using some templates and uh, you pick uh, randomly uh, some ones that you, that you have a variety of, uh, var of uh, data. Um, yes. Since all your data is uh, synthetic, 
uh, how do you deal with uh, the machine learning models overfitting on your data, on the synthetic data? And then when you give it a real world data, um, it doesn't perform well. So how do you tackle the overfitting problem? Um, currently, this is a very hard problem for us because um, nowadays, we, uh, when we first uh, do this project, um, there's no such kind of parallel data. So I generated in our um, basically a template approach. But uh, as you can see, what I have uh, generated is very close to, uh, to the language, uh, a little bit of flexible language. Uh, but uh, as you mentioned, the, the overfit problem is uh, still a very huge problem. So because we have only have a limited number of uh, data, so so once the testing case is not similar to what have what we have trained, so the overfitting problems will be very prominent. So currently, uh, if we purely <laughs> rely on deep learning, this 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 pro this problem is is very hard to. To handle is except that we can have very flexible um, expressions of the requirements. So yes, just use formulas or templates for requirements. So if the models receive uh, like lots of similar texts in that 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 is following some templates, I suspect that they will always uh, outfit. Um, yeah. Or fits, I would say. But uh, uh, something that you can try is uh, some paraphrasing over these requirements, so you can change the form, and then maybe uh, maybe we'll uh, tackle this overfitting problem. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. So I will, I will first next step maybe to do automatic um, data augmentation methods. And I'm also curious about how to use some traditional NLP techniques to, for example, how the syntax analysis and semantic analysis, not purely rely on the end-to-end -end deep learning approach so that we can have more clear information of the uh, requirements because the requirement language is not uh, that flexible than as the natural language, it still has some structure and some keyboards. So maybe this kind yeah. of information can be utilized. That's true. Sometimes language features or yeah, so language yeah. techniques can uh, outperform deep learning. Yeah, yes, yes, exactly. And uh, the, uh, in your work, you translate formulas into natural language. Uh, since you have the data, do, do you think of doing the opposite, like translating natural language into formulas? Ah, uh, what our task is just to translate, translating natural language into formulas. But uh, when I prepare this oh, data set, it is more easier to do a reverse way. So I gen first I randomly generate a data set, uh, a formula, and I found this, yes, this to log yeah, yeah, to. I, I... Yes, yes. Cool. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any more comments or questions? Uh, I have a question. Please. Yeah, so how is the whole graph created? Uh, did you observe any inaccuracies in the generator whole graph? And what impact was that? Could you please repeat? I couldn't hear properly. Oh, sorry. Yeah, like how how is the call graph created in your work, and did you observe any inaccuracies uh, in the generated call graph, and what's the impact of that? Just with me, right? Um, uh, yeah. So with the call graph, uh, so what we decided here is that because we are like trying to build call graphs for like, I think it was like for around thirty thousand packages. And probably amounted to around like 90k releases. So we were focusing more on trying to have it scalable rather than focusing having the most precise uh, uh, core graphs. Um, uh, of course, we did have some uh, imprecisions. So that's mainly, let's say, like that we didn't deal with, for example, function pointers. Uh, and also like the algorithm that we used is more class hierarchy analysis. So that's more like basically trying to understand like uh, yeah, like first of all, like static dispatch, but then like virtual dispatch. So, like, what are like the possible implementations of a function that you can call? Uh, so, it's more or less like around uh, that level. Um, uh, yeah, so th that's pretty much it. Yeah. Thank you. 
Thank you. You, I have a question for you. You look it's to infer types, but can you infer other okay to consider inferring other aspects of the code? Oh uh, sorry, I think you know a little bit from here. You. Your work it's inferring types mm -hmm. from the code, but is it possible to use to infer other aspects? Infer other aspects. Um, what other aspects would you? Uh... That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So, yeah. So we we had to infer uh, aspects such as uh, if it's a variable or if it's a type uh, reference. Say uh, in the example I have earlier, if calendar, someone had a variable called calendar. Mm -hmm. um, if that that would be a class, if it's a variable name. So that's something we had to do. Um, and I think some um, trivial extensions to our current inference could also detect if um, uh, if a variable is used, but it was not declared, um, which is kind of common in Stack Overflow uh, code snippets. Uh, yeah, that's uh, apparently what I can think of off the top of my head. OK. Thank you. Any questions? There are other people in the audience. Please don't be shy and ask questions. Uh, I guess I can do a follow up question. To... Yeah. Okay, please. So, so if you remove uh, the unmute, will the program still run? Uh, you tried. the question i didn't hear uh sorry so if yeah uh, you, you you created this call graph if the unused libraries are removed or the program still run uh do you think uh, so, so remove what uh, someone like i'm not hearing properly uh, uh unused uh libraries ah unused libraries uh, yes, so actually, like uh, when we built a uh, over of uh, network, and so when we're doing the evaluation, we would often find that sometimes libraries are not presented, right? So I think the challenging part with static analysis is that it could either be that it's unused or it's an imprecision in your analysis because you're not able to like find out. Uh, and that can sometimes happen. Uh, so let's say, like, if I would have like a package that only does function pointers something that our call graph agree won't handle, right? Then we will miss a lot of functions. Um, but in general, uh, I mean, I would say that uh, since also according to the Rust uh, language documentation, they say that function pointers is not widely used. So I don't think it's like a major issue. Um, uh, so, I mean, we did find in many cases like that, um, uh, yeah, like uh, th that the APIs are not used in general. And that's also like a very, very interesting thing. Uh, so I see like in many cases that's although like we might depend on some large libraries, we only might be calling like five, six APIs of it. But then like there might be like 30, 40 other APIs that are not used. Right, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Any other question? Okay. So if you don't have any other question, perhaps we can take the opportunity to thank again all our presenters for their nice work. Thank and you. Has a question. Okay. Please. Ah, yes. So my question ah. is, so what's okay, to the two presenters. So what's your plan for uh, your plans for the next step for handling data sets? And it seems that in requirements and engineering, so it is a very data centric. Uh, okay. And uh, normally we lack this huge amount of training data as in the AI community. So 
are there any so what's your plans for handling this kind of lacking data set problem this is to over and to sign correct yeah uh, <clears throat> indeed there is this lack of uh, uh, data in requirements uh, in general. Um, in our current research, we do some data generation, which is based on language models, which can be uh, also good uh, for some tasks. And uh, it can be considered as um, an aspect of data augmentation. It can work, uh, I think, as well for your case if you feed your data or to a, a pipeline that uh, that does data augmentation it can enrich your data to to have a, like a bigger data set that can enable you to train powerful models or or do uh, other solutions uh, yes yes you also think about that <laughs> okay thank you very much Yes, uh, the, uh, well, answering your question, yeah, it's true that uh, we don't have many data points, many requirements. Also, in our case, uh, having not many uh, requirements prevent us to, to use other type of technologies, such as grammar induction, uh, where uh, you can apply kind of, uh, uh, you can, but uh, for applying this type of techniques, you need a lot of data. Uh, and uh, the, that was uh, uh, one of the points that uh, prevent us prevent us to use these these approaches, because uh, for for uh, for example, uh, for building uh, our grammar, uh, we had uh, around two thousand seven hundred requirements from the financial domain. It's not a, a, a big number. Uh, also, for example, uh, for some structures, we have few. Uh, the, we, we have few data points, but for other uh, type of structure, we have uh, a lot of uh, uh, data points, so we have uh, not a, uh, we have an imbalance uh, uh, data data set. Yes, and it's it's a problem. Okay. Thank you very much. So I'll graduate in soon. <laughs> yeah, as Merda said, I hope you graduate soon. Yes, uh, both yeah. of our <laughs> sad are very very close. Yes. Within months. Yeah, we have very excellent research in this conference. Exactly. Good. So I think you should again thank everyone and wish everyone good luck in the graduation and the continuation of the work. And hopefully, we'll see you at the conference in the next couple of days as well. Thank you. Thank you for all the presentations. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you, everyone.